The sounds, I don't like them. Perfect! No! Oh, yes! Now let me ask a question that's relevant, but also relevant at the same time. Can a fandom single-handedly kill a game? Can a fanbase kill the game they claim to love more than anything? It's not a straightforward question to answer, however I'm willing to bet that most of you have jumped to one of the two opposing sides. Either, yeah, shitty fanbases ruin everything, or the death of the game has nothing to do with the fans. Whether you think it's the polarising elitism of a toxic fan, or simply the shallow trend-riding cliché of a short-lived novelty, we're here to explain to you that the answer to this question isn't just black and white. In fact, the grey area is larger than you'd imagine. One way or another, you're not in the wrong if you've already decided what your answer to this question is. There's strong evidence both for and against the sentiment of fans ruining the subject they claim to advocate. There has been a lot of situations in which fans have shown a true toxic volatility towards anyone who shows no interest or sympathy dislikes the subject in question. Then again, there has also been a lot of cases where the fans weren't to blame for the death of a game. People on the outside looking in wrongfully accuse the fans for killing it, when in actual fact, it could have just been down to poor financing, maybe even infighting amongst the developers, or just generally shoddy management. With all that said, I don't particularly lean more towards one side than the other, but to give more insight into the two main sides of this argument, I'm going to pass it on to Makai and Wolferside to share their thoughts. Relevancy is an instrument that is quite difficult to maintain if you don't know how to do the right things, whether it be in the music industry, YouTube, or anything else relating to you making something and requiring an audience. Alas, most people can't then fall off after a certain amount of time, unless you're someone like PewDiePie, Drake, Beyonce, or Queen. This unfortunately happened with a few games, and the question of Fraka mentioned remains here. Can a fanbase single-handedly kill its own game? Primary examples being Undertale, Finance at Freddy's, and we'll be using Tattletail and Mending Machine as honorable mentions. With the given question, I personally think it's not the fandom that kills the game, but instead, the game or outside opinion. Relevancy is a major factor in how long a game stays popular. For example, with hundreds of new Battle Royale games coming out each year, it's difficult for the older, original games to keep their prevalence and power within the genre. But relevancy can also be affected by, you guessed it, the fandom. Or at least in this case, inadvertently. You see, People and fandoms are like walking advertisements for the games they love. Some talk about it with all their friends, some collect and show off all their merchandise, some base their whole being off the games, etc, etc. Now of course, if common logic goes, even if you have a lot of advertisements, if it's not controlled, sometimes it's not going to be good. This leads to fandoms such as FNAF, Minecraft, and Fortnite, who start off with older, more mature fan bases, and then as time goes by, start to be replaced by younger, immature kids. The people who leave the fandom, and people outside the fandom, begin to criticize the game for having such an immature fan base, leading to a negative connotation of the game, and subsequently, less relevancy. But as well, sometimes it isn't the fan base that ruins the game, but the game itself. From bad updates to just bad games in general, some very popular games have a tendency of brutally killing their own platform. For Minecraft version 1.8, the game was left by many, but when the game hit 1.9, further updates were rejected by most of the fanbase, leading many popular Minecraft servers not to update their systems past version 1.8. No Man's Sky was advertised to be one of the greatest games in history, with beautiful open world atmosphere and awesome space travel. Sadly, this was not what was given to us, and on release, the game was hated almost instantaneously. On release, Five Nights at Freddy's was considered an amazing game, and though its predecessors gained similar praise, the franchise soon became notorious for its constant release of new titles, leading to a distaste of the game by some of the community for not just stopping the story. Yes, though a fan base may decide the fate of a game, a game may also be just as devastating and how it destroys itself. Oh, I hate that sound. Oh, Dude, I've had to hear that jump scare like 30 times so far and I'm losing my shit. As much as people like to ride on the idea that a lot of fan bases follow the sheep flock mentality, at the end of the day, people still have standards and know when the products they're advocating is no longer worth defending. This is usually caused by a drop in quality or a case of dwindling interest due to a lack of updates to keep things fresh. 
However, being a member of the wrong crowd can lead to biased opinions, which can be caused by peer pressure or the general need to be part of the vast majority. It's like a twisted democratic clusterfuck. In summary, it's not wrong to lean to one side of the argument over the other. It all boils down to what your personal experiences are with the fandoms in question. Given that Five Nights at Freddy's is the fandom I've had the most connections with during its prime, I'll give a little insight about my thoughts on the fandom and how it developed over time. Please bear in mind that this is ultimately my subjective outlook, and I'm only sharing this as a way to express the idea that everyone has their own ways of interpreting the actions of a fandom protecting the products they love. Anyway, so I picked up FNAF before its significant upwards trend had already begun. I'd played it on Steam a short while before all the famous Let's Players started milking the hell out of it, so I got to witness firsthand how a minor indie salvation of a collapsing developer became a smash Perfect. hit success all over the world, ushering in a new era of fan games theories and creations of all shapes and sizes, all of them dedicated to the tank of a series that FNAF became. This drastic increase in popularity occurred around mid to late 2014, not long after the early access releases of the first FNAF game was made public. Needless to say, all the YouTubers capitalising on indie horror as a main source of material jumped right into it. Five Nights at Freddy's was even the breeding ground for a lot of smaller channels to get a drastic bump in their subscriber base, going from tens of thousands straight into the millions. Anyways, anything that gains a spike in popularity that fast is bound to have just as many haters as fans. But how many of the cases warranted hate, and how many cases didn't? I'll try to explain why both sides have some contribution to the minor, um, downwards trends the series faced in regards to how outsiders perceived the fanbase. Let's start by looking at things from the perspective of a fan, more specifically how I felt as a fan during the game's early days. The good side of the fanbase comprised of many creative minds. Hey! You punch bad guys? Yeah! Dedicated followers of a new take on point and click horror games. We admired the game for its unique premise and the cryptic lore surrounding the in game events, turning what could be seen as a simple experience into a fully fledged universe of dark undertones. These fans created many OCs based on the animatronics seen in game, giving a lot of artists some well needed attention as well as serving as a way for people to suggest new and inventive ways to expand the series. From here, a multitude of fan games were developed, free to play and download from game. Jolt. So many have been made that FNAF became its own category on the side. This has led a lot of young minds into the world of basic game development and 3D modelling, as well as giving a lot of developers the opportunity to collaborate with each other. All these positive aspects were bred from the sheer enthusiasm of a positive fanbase, showing how influential a seemingly small indie project can become. The bad side started to arise when the typical let's make porn of the characters shtick became more prominent, followed by the unnecessary expansion of an intention simple premise regarding the characters. Needless to say, this isn't the first game to have this happen to it, and it certainly won't be the last. From here, the notoriety of the bad fans became more prominent, giving outsiders the ammunition they needed to flame the series and blame the people who liked it for the seemingly toxic atmosphere. This couldn't be further from the truth, as the amount of humble, genuine fans who just liked the series for what it was far outweighed these taints on the community. It's just that when a fanbase like this develops a bad side, their numbers may be small, but their actions make their presence far more prominent to the outsiders due to their poor way of reflecting their liking for the series. This is usually through means of elitism and acting like their way of perceiving the identity of the characters is superior, defeating the point of the game's purposely cryptic nature. So in summary, I don't think it was the fanbase that led to FNAF's decline. It's just down to the lack of transformative changes made in the overall gameplay. It's safe to say that Scott Cawthon has definitely milked the series dry, and I don't blame him. Seeing a small project becomes such a juggernaut would prompt anyone to do so, and kudos to him for always being loyal to his fans all the way through, always keeping what they wanted in mind and accommodating as many requests as possible. However, the toxic side of the fanbase was still there, and with every game that takes off like this, there always will be one. It's just up to you as an outsider to decide if that should detract from the product in question. <laughs> I myself had an experience with the FNAF fandom. Ooh, this is a flashback to September 2014. FNAF's popularity had reached its peak, and it was the chat of the hour. My friends had become hooked on it, never shutting up about the game and its characters. I had already grown a dislike from the game simply from the hype and let's players, not wanting to even touch the game. As days went on, my friends would constantly attempt to pressure me to play this game. Eventually, I played it in spite to make a friend shut up and truly see if it was worth it. Spoiler alert, three minutes in, I was bored out of my mind and couldn't even continue. I hated it, as expected, which simply angered me further. 
This being an example as why I believe fandoms can single-handedly kill its own game, closing the gates for any outsiders to try it and giving them an automatic negative perception. When you hype up anything in general, mainly a music artist or video game, expectations for such shoot up, as does the viewer base. With the noise becoming louder and louder, here comes the term shoved in people's faces. With people believing the game is obnoxious because it's always being pressured onto them, people don't even want to try it. And eventually, all hype dies. It may take weeks, months, or a maximum of a year, but for our beloved Finance of Freddy's, it took an estimation for around 7 months. Once the hype dies, fans slowly but surely pour out of the gates, some faster than others from getting bored of the train or even growing out of it. A toxic fan base added to the mix is always an incredibly strong chemical, and we all know when the gates are closed for new fans, from the toxicity and annoyance from the hype, it had nowhere to go but down, because it wasn't going to stay relevant forever. Nothing. Ever. Does. Let's say some people from the outside decided to try the game a little bit later during the hype, and their expectations are high because of all the talk. The game wasn't much, just a button presser with some cheap jump scares. Oh no, it's so scary! Oh! Which is why I mentioned the audience it aimed for was a bit younger. Myself, with everyone talking about it and gaining mass traction for the video game, maybe expect it to be, well, just a bit more than what it actually was. But, uh, alas, everyone's different with different perceptions and ways to think. My experience with FNAF fandom is why I understand people's dislike of Undertale with its fanbase and hype as well. I've met a few people who told me they didn't like Undertale because of how the fanbase was highlighted, which made them connect the fanbase and the game together, having negative thoughts about it. But that's something a lot of people don't fathom. Separating the game and the fandom, unless the person in question had the same experience as I did, you can't really help yourself. I can't FNAF. Let me put you into a beautiful hypothetical. You're 14, early 2015. You're a realist, but lean a bit more towards the pessimistic side. FNAF's hype had reached its peak two months before, but it's still going strong. A few fans kept bickering you about playing the game. You say you might. You go on any social media, let's say Twitter or YouTube. You never stop hearing about the game. It's everywhere. The fans, which are also your friends, continue to pressure you to play the game. Seeing it everywhere and your friends eager, you may get high expectations for it as well, despite already annoyed by those fans and seeing it everywhere you go. Unfortunately so, you continue to see it even more in the following days, then you get to a point where you don't even want to play the game anymore. Or let's say you do try it, and you don't like it at all. You may have liked the game if you tried it from the beginning, without getting pressured or having it in your face all the time, which is the end of the hypothetical. In a rough conclusion, I believe a fan can single-handedly kill a game shaping the outside's perception with hype, pressure, raising expectations, and toxicity. These four factors driving people away to outsiders picking a different poison. Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, everything I'm a ugly except my phone number. If I could, I would, but it ain't cause I can't nigga game. Bitch, I be my me, give a fuck about what you think. I know all up in my sheets, bitch, my swag is so complete. Get a yellow bone, nigga, ugly, God gon' lick her feet. And I'm always getting pussy, but I'm still gon' be my me. I beat my me.